Good afternoon. I want to begin by reminding everyone that there's no need for alarm. This is what we have been preparing for since this pandemic began, a strong surveillance program, rapid case identification, strong contact tracing, and surge capacity to respond to rapidly changing situations. I want to be clear about what we know and what we still need to confirm. We know the evidence we have points to at least one undetected case of COVID-19 in Yellowknife between November 30th and December 4th. We have received the second updated wastewater result of that um, extended timeline to December 4th. We know that we have completed 300 negative diagnostic tests since November 30th in Yellowknife. We know that we have asked every person that has entered the Northwest Territories to self-isolate upon entry and to follow strict public health measures. What we don't know is the extent or nature of transmission. It could have been sourced from people who are self-isolated with minor or no symptoms. It could have been from someone who was on a layover and is now out of territories. But it also could mean that COVID-19 is circulating in our communities. We know enough to make the targeted recommendations we have today because one of our many layers of protection was triggered. Wastewater surveillance is an early detection system. And because we have wastewater testing, we were able to survey a large population of people without completing diagnostic tests on them. And because we have managed to maintain containment at this point, we know travelers are the folks we need to target. Our biggest risk is the risk of importation. What we need now is cooperation from our community. And I have full confidence that Yellowknife and the NWT will deliver. I want to remind everyone of what they need to do right now. If you have traveled outside the NWT and were in Yellowknife at any point during your self-isolation from November 30, 30th until today, please arrange to get tested whether you have symptoms of COVID-19 or not. If you have returned to your home community for any reason, but you were self-isolated in Yellowknife during this period, contact your local health center or public health unit and arrange for testing. If you are self-isolating because someone in your household returned from travel, please continue to self-isolate. If you develop symptoms, please range, range for testing. And it is more important than ever, if you have any symptoms of COVID-19 at all, even mild, that you isolate yourself at home right away and contact your local public health unit or health center for testing, whether you have traveled or not. This is the best way we can protect our community and remain in containment throughout this pandemic. If getting tested makes you feel anxious, please understand that it is easier and faster than ever to be tested for COVID-19. And if you are worried about what will happen to you if you receive a positive diagnosis, please know that public health will be there to confidentially support you. And if you are concerned that you may have made a mistake with your self-isolation plan, please know that our main concern is getting people to come forward, tracing contacts and keeping the broader population safe. No mistake is more important than this overarching objective. We care about everyone's safety first. The bottom line is that coming forward is the best thing you can do to help your community right now. Please do your part to help break any chains of infection. Stay home when you are sick, call and get tested. To encourage folks to come forward, we are doing a proactive outreach as a government. Our office is working with Protect an NWT at the COVID Secretariat to contact everyone who is being recommended for testing. They'll send an email and follow up by phone. While we are reconciling our list currently, we expect this number to be in the hundreds. But you do not have to wait until you hear from them. You can book your appointment in Yellowknife online 
now at nthsa.ca slash COVID hyphen testing, or you can contact your health center. I know everyone will be interested in how this investigation plays out. Our commitment to you is that we will, we will share new information when we have it. What will allow us to characterize the risk is more test results than those who were from those who were in yellow knife. So if you come forward and get tested, it's um, it is helpful for everyone. Then we can find out um, if that person is still in the yellow in yellow knife on the territories and pick it up pretty quickly, nicely. And we will work tirelessly throughout the week to get those answers. As we do, we are strongly recommending that anyone in Yellowknife take our recommendation on masking when you're in public places, particularly seriously at this time. And I also want to remind you that a negative test does not mean that you can stop self-isolation. You will still need to keep isolating for the full 14-day period. By doing our part and encouraging others to do the same, we can take some control of our risk and protect each other. And always remember to stick to other healthy habits that we know work to stop COVID-19 in its tracks. You need to prioritize physical distance of at least six feet, keep your crowd small and your spaces large. We need to wash our hands frequently, keep our coffees and sneezes to ourselves, stay home when we're sick, and contact our local health center or public health unit to get tested. Stick to our self-isolation plans whenever required. And I know everyone has it in them to rise to this challenge. As we see the light at the end of the tunnel with promising vaccines, now is the time to hold tight, stick together, and do what it takes to push back COVID-19 in our territory. At this point, I would like to pass it off to the executive co-lead for the NWT Health and Social Services Authority COVID-19 response. Scott Robinson to talk about our health system response. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Candola. I'd like to start off by thanking Dr. Candola and all of her team for being such cooperative partners in managing this pandemic as we work closely together, and especially to all of our health authority staff across Northwest Territories who continue to work tire tirelessly to keep the Northwest Territories safe. In response to these latest developments, we have increased our testing capacity throughout the Northwest Territories. Specifically in Yellowknife, we are increasing our hours of service, as well as the number of staff that we have available at our COVID testing location at the Yellowknife Primary Care Center. We will be open until 8 p.m. today, tomorrow, and Friday, and we'll expand our existing weekend hours as we reevaluate. To help to manage the demand, we have launched an online booking service. We ask everyone to, where possible, to book online. If you have symptoms and cannot get a, a and cannot get an online booking, you can present to the testing location. However, we'd ask uh, to make every effort to book online first. But we will do our best to accommodate people with symptoms who do show up for testing, as these are our priorities. We have also deployed our COVID rapid response team to the Yellowknife Isolation Center to set up a separate testing location for people who are currently self-isolating in the self-isolation center. We also have testing capacity availability in every single one of our health centers across Northwest Territories. And all of our uh, all of our facilities are ready to respond, uh, ready to, uh, to test people who may have already traveled home to their home communities after completing their self-isolation in Yellowknife on the dates that are covered by this public health advisory. As of 2.45 p.m. today, our Yellowknife Testing Centre has processed 76 individuals and our isolation centre uh, sent, uh, location uh, just began this afternoon and we've already processed three individuals. We'd also like to remind people please to not present to the emergency department for testing. If you have an emergency, of course, you can go to the emergency department, but please do not present to our emergency departments for testing as they are not set up to handle these volumes. We continue to 
monitor the situation, monitor our capacity, and we are adding more staff. We have additional staff on standby and we will add as required. But we'd like to thank everyone for their patience as we respond to this demand for testing that is new for us. We will continue to prioritize our testing of samples in the Northwest Territories at both Stanton and Inuvik hospitals for people with symptoms. If we exceed our capacity, those will be sent to our partner laboratory in Alberta, uh, which uh, so far the, this, the samples that we have been sending out, we have still been re receiving fairly rapid turnaround within 48 hours of the samples arriving in Alberta. And our uh, testing in Northwest Territories uh, over the last eight weeks has been approximately 24 hours turnaround uh, once the sample arrives at our laboratories here. So all of our staff are working extra hours. We are uh, adding extra staff to respond to this additional demand. And uh, we're looking forward to the opportunity to put our skills to, uh, to use uh, in serving our, our, uh, our clients in the Northwest Territories. Thank you. Thanks very much, Scott, and thanks very much, Dr. Candola, for those remarks. Uh, we're going to move to the Q&A portion now, um, and today I would like to get started with Sarah Sibley at Cabin Radio. Go ahead, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us today and filling us in on some information. Um, I saw in a letter that's circulating around that you're confident the level of COVID-19 in the sample tested is higher than it would be for one case of COVID-19. Can you explain to us a little bit more about how you know that? Sounds like that one's for Dr. Candola. Thank you, Sarah. So on um, November 27th, I believe we had issued a public health advisory related to um, a case in Yellowknife in a non-resident worker who tested positive for COVID. Uh, we've been doing wastewater surveillance in Yellowknife since late October, and we are uh, collecting on a continuous basis. So our uh, samples are collecting a small amount of wastewater over a 24 hour period. So we are, we have good care, coverage and we have a good assessment about what, what's happening. Um, typically when we have a known case of COVID in Yellowknife, we tend to see a weak signal in the wastewater. So that's, that's what we were seeing with, uh, we had a known case in Yellowknife. Has those cases are um, recuperate, recover, that signal should get weaker. Um, especially as the days go by and what was different with the uh, November 30 to December 2nd sample was that signal um, increased in intensity and it was uh, above the baseline and a repeat sample uh, was just provided to me just before the media conference and that signal has remained the same so it's not getting weaker it's um, still about the same so that indicates to me that there is at least one unaccounted case of um, COVID in Yellowknife. Um, the signal intensity doesn't usually tell you how many cases, but there is it's above the baseline and above what we expected. What we were expecting is has this um, initial case has recovered, um, that the signal will be weak to uh, non-detectable again, but that is not the case. And one follow up for you, Sarah. Yeah, um, and I, from what I understand earlier, you said you're working on trying to contact people. Does that include essential, essential workers who have exceed, uh, received exemptions? Absolutely, it includes um, essential workers who were isolated um, in Yellowknife during the period of November 30th to now. It's anyone who is isolated there are some some essential workers that are routinely being tested, and so we have a good um, indication that the ones that we've tested, they've they've obviously they're negative. So we're we're not targeting the the essential workers who already got tested, but we are targeting essential workers or residents that were isolated at whatever time in their period from November 30th to now, just to uh, pick up and identify. Um, that individual individuals who may not have any symptoms or are starting to feel symptoms 
um, that are that we're picking up the signal in the wastewater, and that includes everyone. That includes essential workers. It includes residents. It includes family me members visiting their loved ones here in Yellowknife. Basically, anyone who's traveled out of the territory um, and into Yellowknife, uh, they get tested um, if they've isolated here from any time between November 30th to now, with the exclusion of the um, small amount of essential workers that are already being routinely tested. Thanks for that, Dr. Kendall. And and Sarah, to your point, um, you know, I think you were basically asking for the characterization of what the res what the advice is for essential workers. There's a couple of good paragraphs in the public health advisory that explain it quite well for your story later. Um, so next up, I would like to call Thomas Eche from Radio Taiga. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Loud and clear, Thomas. Perfect. My only question uh, would be um, when the, the, the next results of the uh, wastewater samples will be available? Um, so it was um, literally the, the first wastewater results that was in the public health advisory was November 30th to December 2nd. And the December 2nd and December 4th wastewater results literally came into my inbox five minutes before this press conference. The next one will be from December 4th, 2 p.m. to December 7th, um, 2 p.m. Typically, we uh, test, we, we um, ship these wastewater samples to the National Microbiology Laboratory, which is in Winnipeg. So there is a delay due to transport, and then they have to run the tests and so the test that we got today was um, test results up to December 4th, 2 p.m. So what you can see is there's about a five day delay in results. So the December 7 results that um, that was sent out on December 7, we probably expect those results at the um, this at the end of this week or early next week. It all depends on transport delays. Thanks, Dr. Kendall. And Thomas, did you have a follow-up? Uh, no, no, thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I would like to hear from Sarah Minogue at CBC now. Oh, thanks, Mike. Uh, I, I guess the answer to this might be obvious, but I think I'll just ask it anyway. Have there been any signals at all picked up in the wastewater testing in the other communities where it's been deployed? That's an excellent question. Um, as you recall, we had a public health advisory related to Fort Smith, and there were um, five cases that were isolating, and Fort Smith initi initiated their wastewater sampling November 20th, so those cases had already um, been identified in the community, and the wastewater did pick up those cases in Fort Smith, and the signal has diminished. But wastewater sampling is just a great early warning tool, and we've been um, working with it, collecting samples since late October to now. And we, we, when we've had known cases, it has signaled. And when those cases have cleared and are no longer uh, shedding virus, uh, the wastewater goes back to a no detect signal. And one follow-up for you there, Sarah. Did I lose you, Sarah? Oh, sorry. No, I'm still here. I just lost my phone. Um, I, I have one more question, and it is, what if we don't find the source of this case? Are we looking then at more restrictions in our community? So the, the good news is that the second um, sample that we, we attained has not seen um, an increase in signal intensities. It's just been about the same. And so we uh, will continue to monitor. We are testing widely. What I had talked about in my public health advisory, um, since November 30th, we've done 300 tests in symptomatic P 
people, people who presented with COVID symptoms and they've tested negative. So this is just one layer of surveillance. Um, if we don't pick up uh, the source case, that person could have come and left or could have cleared the virus and was isolated and alone. Um, the main thing that we need to be looking at is um, has there been uh, increase in the signal, um, looking at uh, people presenting uh, with no travel history symptomatic and getting COVID. And those are our ways of monitoring if there's community transmission. But right now, there's nothing to indicate that there's community transmission. When it relates to restrictions, we'll continue to monitor if we do see community transmissions um, based on our ability to contain and um, track and be able to know the contact tracing doesn't mean we would, we would add additional restrictions. The one uh, recommendation I would have for Yellowknife, because just because we're getting a surge in travelers, uh, I still see people um, entering um, stores, um, not physically distancing, not wearing masks. It's in your best interest and the best interest of, of community members, particularly in this winter period, everyone's indoors. We have a surge of travelers coming in who should be self-isolating. This would be a very wise move that everyone wear their mask in indoor public spaces. This is my recommendation for right now. Thank you, Dr. Candola. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and thank you, Sarah, as well. Um, I would like to give Natalie Pressman over at uh, News North a chance to ask some questions. Go ahead, Natalie. Thanks very much. I was just wondering, given some of the previous false positives with COVID testing, if there's any, how likely is it that there could be a false positive with the wastewater testing system? I really love, I love these questions. They're great questions. So one of the things about wastewater testing is someone um, could be, could have been, could have tested positive, clear, um, recovered, and still be shedding dead virus for weeks. And so when we um, look at the wastewater and we look at a signal detects in the wastewater, we have no way of knowing if this is um, dead COVID virus or if it's viable COVID virus. And so we were just erring on the side of um, caution and just um, retesting and making sure we test everyone so we can pick up um, an active case. But we don't know from the wastewater if this and if we can call it a false positive if, if it's a dead virus and if there's no risk of transmitting then it's not um they're not really infectious but we don't know from the wastewater so we're, this is a precautionary approach just to make sure we try to find out who is shedding covid virus in their in the wastewater and um, see if they're infectious and isolate and protect other people from getting it that's the main purpose Thank you, Dr. Candola. And a follow up there, Natalie? Yeah, I was just wondering if you could maybe expand on the separate testing locations for those in isolation centers and how that would work. Sounds like a question for my buddy Scott. Yes, thank you. So we have two testing locations set up in Yellowknife, the, the regular one at Yellowknife Primary Care, uh, which was formerly a drive through location we did indoors because of the weather. And we've expanded our capacity there and then and that's bookable online then we set up a separate location at the isolation center that is for people who are currently in the isolation center that won't be open to people uh, to the general public at this time uh, to uh, provide additional capacity and as of right now we're operating both of those locations from about 8 8 30 until 8 p.m daily thanks for that scott um, uh, I'd like to give Francis Tessier Burns a shot at the mic here. Go for it, Francis. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, question for Dr. Candola. Maybe uh, I may be missing something. I guess I'm just curious if if we know the sample dates right now, November 30th to December 2nd, and then the latest samples being uh, up to December 4th. Uh, like I'll speak personally for, for a second, my partner and I have come back and now we're in self-isolation beginning on December 6th. 
so people who are in similar situations to mine, if we know that the dates are prior to that, why should people who have returned past those dates still go get tested? That's, that's an, a, an excellent question. Right now, um, we don't know where this individual is isolating. And even though we have results up to December 4, it's been, um, we still have a five day delay. So that person, we pick, maybe we picked up the uh, COVID before they were symptomatic and they could be becoming symptomatic right now. Cause we don't know exactly what, what is occurring. We don't know if, um, the person is, um, contacting other people, if that the isolation center, contacting other people, if there's been um, transmission. And so because we didn't know the extent, we have the second report of where this um, transmission is occurring. This was um, adding the ones after December 6th. It's an abundance of precaution. Obviously, you, you um, came in a later date. You're not in that area of um, risk. But if you're in the isolation centers and people Sometimes people feel if you're isolating, we're isolating, we came in the same time, we can join up. So there could be um, transmission happening that way. So it was more cast the net wide because it would have been um, a lot more complicated to narrow it to um, what we think is occurring when we, it, it could be just much more complicated. So anyone from November 30th to December 4th, yet yeah, there is a, a case, but we're just asking anyone coming here because the person could have, um, while they're not infectious, transmitted to other isolators, and we can't narrow that down. So it's um, just casting the net wide. But I take your question. Thank you. And just to sum that up, I think, Francis, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Candola, it's that, you, as we mentioned in the public health advisory, there's there's as much of a chance that there might be some community, uh, so there's as much of a chance with the evidence that we have right now that there may have been some transmission in the community, uh, which you know it's it, it, it's it's a complicated network that gets uh, gets drawn once that happens, um, and it's important to be very to be very protective and very diligent about testing folks who could have possibly been exposed. Correct, Dr. Candola. Yes, I take I take his point though, um, and, he, and it's an excellent point. Um, but we we're just casting the net wide right now, and um, we we got the second result and it stayed steady. But we don't know if it's going to amplify um, in the third result. So is has just out of abundance of precaution, test everyone from November thirtieth to now. But your point is well understood. Fair enough. I guess I, I mean to keep going along the this similar point. You know. Uh, someone who's coming into the territory tomorrow or coming in on Friday or Saturday, like how far does it go where public health is going to be comfortable saying like it is today the last day where people are arriving and then they're going to get tested? Or is this something that people are going to have to do retroactively, not retroactively, but now kind of going forward uh, if they come in say later this week? I think it, when we did the public health advisory, it would be up until the point of the public health advisory. So the um, the difficulty is um, this person, the fresh intake, um, there's a low risk. For, for If anyone develops symptoms, obviously go get tested. But we, we don't really know what's happening with this case. This case could be isolating with other people who could be developing symptoms later um so it's not so much of we, it could be one case it could be two cases so we don't know where these cases are and if who's isolating with them and how it's spreading but uh we wouldn't it would be up until the point of the public health advisory any fresh intakes unless they have symptoms or there's they have contact with covid case or there's a reason to believe that they're high risk uh we wouldn't necessarily test them we would try to start the highest risk point would be starting between November 30th and December 4th, but that person could have then cleared it and now it's passing on to someone else they're isolating with. So it's, it's um, an, a, a very aggressive open net, but the period would be from November 30th to the point of the public health advisory. Okay, thanks. 
Thanks for your questions, Francis. And uh, thank you for self-isolating appropriately. It's a great example to set. Um, I'd like to uh, call on Paul Bickford if he's joined us. Going once for Paul. All right, looks like Paul has not joined us. So I think the last person in my, I've got two more people left in my list here for first round. Uh, I'll go to Bailey Morton. Hopefully you've had some time to warm up now after joining Bailey. Yeah, thanks, mate. Uh, I've, this is a question for Dr. Candola. Um, I know you said the, there's, you don't know the location of where the uh, traces may have come from. Is there a, like future improvements to the auto sampler that could be made so the location will be narrowed down more when traces are detected or is it just a reality of the technology that it's always going to be a broad uh, location for detecting traces? That's um that's a sophisticated uh, technology that I would defer to um, Justin Hazelberg and Maka about um, being able because I in Yellowknife we have two lines that um, where we have a wastewater um, coming through we the the line that we're using covers seventy five percent of the population and we're looking at inserting an auto sampler in the other line so we could definitely tell you which line that is used. Uh, but the sophistication of looking at where within um, one line um, identifying where that location is, that's beyond myself and I don't, I, it's a composite example. So I don't know if it can be done, but I'm going to defer that question to Justin Hazenberg at MACA, who's an engineer who understands the intricacies of the wastewater system more than I, but I don't, I don't know. The only way I can see is if you put an auto sampler next to a building like a school, then you would know definitely would come from there. But our auto samplers are um, basically covering 75% of the yellow knife. So I don't think you can isolate to one area in that um, one line that we're testing. But I can always, Mike can always deflect it to Justin and see if there's a sophisticated way of isolating it into one specific uh, region, which I have, I don't know exists. All right, one follow-up for you, Bailey. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ganilla, I'm sorry if this is another technical engineering question, um, but is there like a, is there ways that the virus could circulate through the auto sampler again? So I guess it would be a false positive within the auto sampler, so maybe the same COVID case could be detected multiple times, traces of it could be detected multiple times with the wastewater testing? I will deflect that to Justin Hazelberg. Mark is not here, but what I do know is we have been doing um, composite samples um, in Yellowknife since uh, late October and um, when we've had cases, we picked up signals. When we've had no cases, it's been negative. And the signal intensity um, seems to reflect um, how uh, symptomatic they are and how far away from the symptoms they are. So it's, it has worked in the other scenarios where um, as the cases recover, the signals become weak to no detect. Um, and so this is highly unusual for us to be picking up an, an increase in the signal when a case has been recovered, so there should be uh, no uh, COVID virus in the wastewater. So I don't think that your theory is plausible, but we will deflect that to an, um, an engineer who knows the auto sampler better than a physician. Okay, thanks for your questions, Bailey. And we'll go to Baptiste at Radio Saga. Bonjour. Um, just to narrow it down t uh, things a bit, uh, you mentioned that there are there's about there were in the hundreds uh, in means of uh, people that are targeted by 
this uh, request for uh, testing. Can you just narrow it down? Are we talking like 100 people or 999? Or uh, uh, what? What is your expectation of how many people uh, will be contacted or and needs to be tested according to uh, the requirement? So we can give you firmer figures later. That would come from the COVID Secretariat protecting the BT, mm -hmm. who are collating um, the numbers as we speak and, and firming those up. Um, I can just ask Mike if that that, that was provided to him because we can provide that later. But right now they're um, telling as we speak. Uh, and we'd be happy to provide that information when it becomes available. Thank you. All up for you, Batiste. Yeah, just uh, and then I guess the other end of this is the the testing capacity. Uh, do you have any idea how the the number of people that need will need to be tested in the coming hours and days uh, compared to what is the usual flow of test and, and yellow knife? Uh, do, do you do you, do you foresee that we won't have uh, the capacity and that some of those uh, <clears throat> some of uh, the tests will need to be sent out to uh, Alberta? Well, I can answer that uh, question. Um, right now, we process approximately 300, between 300 and 400 tests per week at our lab with our laboratory devices between Stanton and Nuvik Hospital. We have the capacity to run at least 500 per week without any additional effort. Uh, based on the what we know about returning travelers to the Northwest Territories, we know this is going to increase, and and um, Cami can uh, tell me the exact numbers, but I think between 700 and 1,000 people per week are coming back into the Northwest Territories. So we've um, uh, uh, we we have the uh, the capacity to expand uh, with that, uh, like. Um, to, to provide additional testing here in Yellowknife. So what, one of the things we're doing to increase our testing capacity at the laboratory here uh, in Yellowknife is what's called uh, sample pooling. So instead of putting one, uh, one sample into a test cartridge, we can put multiple samples into a test cartridge. And then if that comes back positive, we then split those, take those samples and split them out again uh, to retest them. So that helps us to improve our throughput of testing. So with that, combined with the additional uh, staffing that we have on and the additional hours the laboratory is going to be working, uh, we're confident we're going to be able to expand our testing to uh, meet the majority of our needs for, uh, for, for samples collected uh, in, in, the, in the end of UT. With that, we will always prioritize the samples. We have a, a way to mark our samples as, as what the, the priority is. And any sample that had that's from someone that has symptoms will always be prioritized because there's the highest highest risk for us, and we'll ensure that those ones are performed here on our devices in the Northwest Territories. And then, if we exceed our capacity, we will then send those down to our partner laboratories in Alberta. Uh, but given that we anticipate this to be a short-term surge, we believe we can handle the majority of the tests that we're going to need to process. Uh, in the NWT uh, based on the information that we have right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Batiste. And Bailey, just to come back to some of your questions on recirculating, I, I took the liberty of messaging uh, my colleagues and can confirm that that's not a possibility um, as far as uh, wastewater recirculating and the testing. It's all it's all new poo. Um, so um, we're going to go through the list another time here. Um, so we're going to go to Sarah Sibley back at Cabin Radio for another round of Q&A. Hi, thanks, Mike. Um, this question's for Dr. Candola. I believe it was when you were answering, uh, answering Natalie's question. You said that people can be shedding the dead virus for weeks. So does this mean um, so it doesn't have any different like amount of signal like detection in it? It can be the same strength as if somebody currently still had the virus? Or could you clarify that a little bit? Yeah, so the wastewater picks up the COVID virus, but it can't tell you if it's dead or alive. And so, so we could, um, there, there are scenarios where people have been infected and they can shed the virus um, for weeks, but most people tend to clear the virus within uh, 
10 days. So this is um, a more rare type of person. However, in just to be cautious, if we see a signal, we want to make sure that there isn't anyone in the yellow knife who has currently has COVID or someone who left yellow knife was isolated during that period who has COVID because it only takes one person to start the chain of transmission. And so we do have the advantage here where uh, wastewater is considered has an early warning signal. So what happens is what's more a common scenario is that people start to um, shed the virus before they develop symptoms, in fact, days before they start to develop symptoms. So it's a, a good way to, um, by aggressively testing the way we are, we can try to pick it up before um, quickly and try to contain and isolate the person. It could be someone that came in here and has already left. Um, we don't know if to continue monitoring the wastewater surveillance, or it could be someone who's quietly isolating by themselves who are not at risk of transmitting to others. We really don't know. Or, and so the best way is to test uh, everyone who has traveled during that period, because that's our biggest risk is um, importation, and see if we can find this, um, any individuals who have this virus. And we are urging anyone that if you are symptomatic, if you are starting to develop symptoms, you are symptomatic, get tested now. Um, that would be the quickest and easiest way to see if you have COVID is to get tested while you're symptomatic. And that that's regardless if you travel or not. And one follow up for you, Sarah. Yeah, just a quick follow up. It's also for Dr. Candola, just on a bit of a different note. Um, you mentioned in your opening remarks um, that if people make a mistake on their self isolation plan, um, they have to be sure to fix it. Is this something that you guys have been seeing a lot of issues with or are in like intending seeing um, coming up to all the travelers coming in for the holiday season? Sarah, I don't know that she said that they, they needed to fix it. I think that it was more focused on the importance of coming forward, um, even if you're a little bit nervous if you did that you did make a mistake at some point in your self-isolation plan. Uh, but I'll let Dr. Candola, uh, and I'll send you the copy of the remarks after, if you'd like. Um, For sure, thanks. And uh, Dr. Candola, if you just wanted to comment on the importance of, uh, of self-isolation at this time, particularly with increased travel, that would be great. Yeah, I think it's has to um, deal with fear, anxiety, stigma, feeling like you're going to be discriminated. Like typically, um, we've been very fortunate that uh, the, the COVID cases that came forward and got tested who were symptomatic allowed us to um, find their contacts, isolate, isolate them and prevent further community transmission. But when we um, pick up an unaccounted for case, like in this wastewater example, it, it means that there's someone out there that could be afraid to come forward. They could be having symptoms, and we needed um, they they could have um, breached isolation, or it could have been someone who didn't travel, who um, met with someone who had traveled, and they're afraid to come forward. They're afraid to get tested, and it was more to m make sure that um, the community comes first, um, not to be afraid. All we want to do is find out who has the virus and to do that through testing and then isolate and look at their contacts. That's the main focus of this um, public health advisory. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Candola. And I think that covers Sarah's question quite well. Um, so uh, I did actually just wanna check in. There's one individual uh, who's, who's in the room right now, uh, whose name is anonymous. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that you weren't someone who was looking to ask questions. Okay, hearing nothing, so I'm going to move on. Um, I'll go to Francis Tessier Burns at CKLB once again. I guess maybe a bit more of a technical question. I guess I'm just curious what it looks like. Like, how can public health officials tell whether? Uh, how can I phrase this? I'm thinking in this case, it's relatively easy to tell that there is something that went undetected in the sense that there shouldn't be any signal in the wastewater, but there is. So obviously something is, is amiss there. But if there were cases in Yellowknife, let's say, you know, two active cases, would it then be possible that there was some, uh, some cases that weren't detected either? Uh, 
how do you measure how much COVID is in wastewater in two cases versus five cases when the numbers are so small compared to, you know, one versus a thousand? So thank you for that question. The um, We can't tell you the number of cases for the wastewater sampling. We can tell you if there's a, a significant departure from the baseline. So the, the from the baseline, we were experiencing a weak signal. We knew that there was one identified case of COVID and we expected that signal intensity to go down. And so when the signal intensity um, goes up significantly, we can't tell you how many cases, but we can say it, it's, it's an indication that there's at least one person out there who's um, secreting COVID virus for their wastewater. And so having even one person out there is enough for us to say, let, let's go back and if our biggest risk is importation, just the safest thing we can do is just go back and test it and everyone see if we can pick it up that way. Gotcha. Thanks, that's it. Thanks for that, Francis. And to Natalie Pressman at North, News North, please. Thanks very much. Um, just another clarification question uh, for you, Scott. I'm sorry to ask you to rehash this again, but I just um, wasn't clear on, I guess, how people should get tested exactly. It sounds like people in isolation, the testing facilities will sort of come to them. Could you? I'm, I'm sure I'm getting too far into the weeds here, but maybe you could help me out and clarify a little bit on that note. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So we're doing a combination of things. Protect NWT is helping to call all the people that are in the isolation center uh, that would be affected by this and advising them that uh, testing is going to be available at the isolation center and the hours. We're posting signs at the isolation center and, uh, and our communications team is working on other methods of getting in touch with people who might go and put letters under their door. Uh, and then we're scheduling people there at the isolation center for, uh, for testing. Uh, and uh, and we'll, uh, we'll adjust capacities required. We can only put so many people in, uh, in one room. So if we find that the, our demand is very high there, we may refer people to uh, another location or we may ask for additional space. And a follow up for you, Natalie? Just to clarify, when you say the isolation center, that's the Nova Hotel? I don't actually know that. Uh, I, I think that's where it is, but uh, I haven't been to the isolation center. I've just dispatched the team there, so I'd have to ask them exactly where they are. Uh, I can confirm. It's, it's the Chateau Nova. That's, okay. the, that's, the, that's the isolation okay. center. It sounds right, but right. I, didn't want to, I didn't want to say yes and uh, be incorrect. For sure. Thanks so much. And thank you for your questions. Um, I would like to go to Thomas Etche at Radio Taiga. Thomas, did you have any more questions? Uh, no, I have no more questions. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining, Thomas. And Sarah Minogue, would you like another oh, question Mike. or two? I do just have one more question for Dr. Kendall. As she, she spoke a couple times about how important it is to wear masks in Yellowknife, and she's recommended that. I'm just wondering if that's a formal directive or if that's required. Uh, that's my question. Yeah, this is a, a common question. Right now, it's a it's a recommendation. Um, I I wear a mask. Um, I protect myself. I protect you. You wear a mask. You protect me from secretions. We're mainly going to be indoors. Um, this is the um, Christmas holiday season, so a lot more people are in the stores and buying last minute items. We have a surge of travelers coming in, not just travelers to visit families, but a lot of workers are coming in to replace workers who are taking a break over the holidays. So it's it's a recommendation. We have, um, if we have indication to believe that um, there is community transmission and, and dependent on our ability to contain that, then the, the recommendation can become more formal, but right now it is um, a recommendation. Thanks, and did you have a follow-up, Sarah? I have a follow-up, it's unrelated. I just wanted to ask, uh, since we're all here, if there's any further information on the vaccines. Uh, 
stay tuned for Friday. Um, we'll be talking about that specifically then. Thank you. And thank you, Sarah, for your questions. And I'd like to go to Batiste one last time as we reach the end of our time here. Do I still have Batiste with me? Looks like Batiste has left. So we'll move to Bailey Morton at True North FM. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, this question for Dr. Kendall there. Um, with it coming to the holiday period and expecting more travel um, and the wastewater testing casts such a wide net, and I think you mentioned, I forget the exact number, but it's going to be in the hundreds of people who should get tested because of the traces. Um, do you think there's, or I guess, have you planned for um, the risk of the testing capacity uh, in the territory becoming overwhelmed by if there's, say, like a couple of traces found in the wastewater, which might result in several hundreds of people having to get tested all at the same time? I think there's probably room for both Dr. Candola and Mr. Robertson to comment on this. I'll, uh, I'll let you guys sort it out between you to see who goes I first. I can speak to that. So we've been planning for surge capacity for testing from the very beginning. We've had various contingency plans in place, and we were anticipating that over the Christmas holidays with the increase in the return of travelers and the potential increase in people with symptoms, the need to be tested. So we have been planning for that. Uh, and and the, the capacity, that, the surge that we, are, you know, that we may see over the next few days uh, may actually surpass what we'd even thought we would see over the Christmas holidays. So we're, uh, we are able to absorb additional capacity. We've been planning for that. And we, when we exceed our ability to test locally in the Northwest Territories, we send the additional swabs to Alberta. We always prioritize swabs to be processed here that are higher risk. So people that have symptoms, particularly people who have traveled and have symptoms, we always aim to prioritize those to be run here so we have the most rapid results. And then we send our overflow samples, particularly ones with asymptomatic uh, testing. If we have any leftover, those would get sent out to Alberta. And uh, those are batched daily by our lab uh, and sent out. And then we get the results back in about 40 hours from when they arrive in Alberta. I don't know if there's anything for you to add, Dr. Candola, but go ahead if there is. I just want to thank Bailey for the question. You know, we have about in the last coming about we have an increase in visitors coming in with about 700 that came in last week and we anticipate more coming in we also have um have an increase in number of cases across canada of over 6,000 daily cases and that number seems to be increasing every day so across canada um a number of the provinces are experiencing a widespread community outbreaks so our importation risk into NWT has never been higher. And given the bulk of those um, travelers are coming through to Yellowknife, we have a very low threshold for testing people with symptoms. And when it comes to wastewater signal, we'll have a low uh, fresh threshold for doing this um, sweep to try to find out where the source is, because this is just the wrong period to um, have a community-wide outbreak and that's what we're trying to prevent we have a lot of people traveling through um, a lot of people who will be um, um, off work off school so more indoor activity in the stores and restaurants and we've had the privilege of keeping our businesses open and so we want to maintain a relaxing phase two for the holiday period and we want to be really aggressive on picking up any signal detects so it's just a heightened um, aggressive approach to continue continue um, having the relaxing phase two that we're enjoying right now. All right. Thank you all so much for your questions today. And uh, as we wrap up for the day, I'll just I'll note that I'll send a copy of Dr. Gendola's remarks uh, to everybody who's on the line. And I would just say, uh, you know, um, keep six feet apart, wear your mask, wash your hands, stay safe, everybody. Have a great day.